basketball game between France and U.S. So as soon as that's over, we'll get started with Sunday school. I got, I got things to do. We got laughing at I'm right there on my phone. Anyhow, we will get st- we will get started because it. For those that don't want to know the score, I, I won't say anything. But yeah, today today's lesson's on worldliness, and it's interesting that. The, the Olympics, for those that pay attention, or even for those that don't, is going on in, in Tokyo, Japan. And, and the Olympics are intended to be a very positive thing. I, I remember as a kid, I got excited about the Olympics. There was a guy named Bruce Jenner who was a pretty amazing athlete back in the day. I don't know what ever happened to him. Um, he was a 1976 Olympian. I remember him on the box of Wheaties as a kid um, in the decathlon. Um, but but it, is, it is sad as what has happened. The, today's lessons on worldliness, and even the Olympics made a point of that. Uh, their song, their choice of songs was a song written by John Lennon, or a song by John Lennon called Imagine. And, and the lyrics of the song are awful. Imagine there's no heaven, you can if you try. I can't imagine, I'm, I'm doing John Lennon songs to start. What kind of doctrine is this? And it's imagine there's no nations, imagine there's no country. And, and everybody will just get along. And it's like, boy, that's, that's, that's a, a people that are it's completely different than what this book has to say. I wish everybody did get along with each other. But I've driven on interstate highways. It doesn't happen that way. I've, I've been to big cities. I, again, you pay attention to what's going on around our country in a lot of places. Uh, we fight over the, the stupidest stuff. I mean, and again, I'm, I'm going to, I got all kinds of things to talk about. I'm pent up. Um, I appreciate Jason teaching class last week. I always miss being here. It's always doing that from a hotel room in York, Pennsylvania, after having a, I'd never had a hotel room flooded out, but we were, gonna, we were going on vacation, we were trying to get, we had a hotel room in Martinsburg that got canceled because of, apparently it rained, it rained there pretty hard last Saturday, and it flooded out two floors of their, of their facility, which was kind of bizarre. But today's lesson, to, to me, is a challenge. I don't know about you, but I like me. I'm not saying you have to like me, but hopefully folks like themselves. We is, it's, it seems to be the nature of people, and that's the essence of only six small verses in James chapter 4. And I call the lesson friend or foe, and it's just a matter of who do we choose to, to be aligned to. Are we aligned with God? Are we aligned with, with self? And, and what a statement verse number 4 is. God's, God's assertion through James is not very pleasant. He uses some nasty words. In fact, a couple of words that he uses only a handful of times in the Scripture in James 4. 4 says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. I don't know about you, but when you walk up to somebody, whether you know them or you don't know them, that's probably not the, one, the way you want to go to greet them, right? Hey, you adulterer and adulteresses, right? Not a very positive. It says, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. And enmity, a word for pretty strong hatred. I mean, enmity is the attitude of a, of a mountaineer fan toward Pitt. Uh, enmity is the attitude of Ohio State fans toward Michigan fans. I mean, it's just, it's, it is amazing, some, some of the things that sports greets out. It says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So we get to choose. Whose side are we on? In life is, I believe, a series of choices. Certainly the most important choice starts with salvation. The rest of it doesn't matter until you pass. I'll call it the entrance exam. Until you pass the entrance exam, the rest of it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just, again, like these Olympics, you have to qualify to get there. It doesn't matter how good you are at whatever you can do. I didn't realize skateboarding was now an Olympic sport. I, just, I, I keep learning things. I'm hoping crossword puzzles become Olympic sports. I have a chance to get there for that. But some of these other things look like too much work. But no matter how talented you are, it doesn't matter to you. Again, qualify for the team. And the same thing's true with this. There's, it doesn't matter what you're going to do with God until you get on the team by trusting Christ as Savior. And you might say, you say that all the time. That's right. And, and God forbid I ever stop talking about that. Because the most important decision is where do you stand with Christ, whether you're in the room here today or online or whether you watch this later, is where, have you, where do you stand with Christ? What have you done with what the Bible says? Have you done what the Bible says about him? Somebody asked me, are you going to heaven when you die? Yes, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Because I believe there's only two choices, ma'ams and sirs. Um, but that's a different lesson. How do I know? I just, I just did what the book says. I believe what the Bible had to say. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. I, I did that. That's all I got to offer. If the book is not true, then I'm in trouble. But if the book be true, I just, just did what it said. But that's the starting place of choosing friendship because, again, James 4 is written to believers. It is not written to folks that are burning down police stations. It's not, it's not written to folks 
that are making fun of military, that are making fun of governments. It's talking to, if you go to the beginning of the book, is talking to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, and James starts out in James 1, 2 with my brethren. So again, today's, today's lesson is all about looking at ourselves and saying, hey, how do I stack up with this? What is my attitude toward the world? What is my attitude toward the things of God? Who's, who, who, who am I a friend to? And for most people, it's, it's pretty rare to be all in, especially the adulterer, adulterer side of, of sucked into the world. But especially us in America, where we've got it made. It is so easy to appeal to the world's things and stuff that we can find ourselves an enemy of God by accident, sadly. But today's lesson, challenging lesson, six verses. Where do we stand with the Creator? Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into it. Our Lord and our God, we love you. We need you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for Jesus Christ who gives us hope, who gives us purpose. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the relationship you give us uh, that, Lord, allows us to fellowship with you, to be part of, of your plan, uh, to make a difference in a world that desperately needs your Son. Uh, Lord, there is contention and strife over so many subjects, both here in America and abroad. Uh, Lord, help us not to be distracted. Help us to be diligent. Uh, to realize that uh, the true enemy is Satan. Uh, the true enemy is seeking to deceive and to devour. Uh, the true enemy is seeking to confuse. Uh, Lord, we pray to help us to be light and salt uh, that we might serve you. Lord, help us uh, to let your Holy Spirit examine us. If there be uh, places where worldliness creeps in, where life is about us and not about you, uh, the Lord, that you would help us to get those things right with you, to turn those things over to you even today. Lord, we love you and we need you. Lord, help us to seek you. Lead us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So last week, and it's important to, to pay attention to where we ended last week. We're going to go to the next slide. Um, we're going to talk about contention. The first verse says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? And we need to remember where we left off. Again, the, the passages and the chapters and the verses are, are, not, are not inspired. It is a, a straight James again wrote this letter. So where we left off last week at the end of chapter 3, especially verse number 18 that says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown of peace in them that make peace. God calls us to be peacemakers. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. The peace that comes from God, verse 17, the prior verse. The wisdom is from above, is pure. It is from above, is pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy, being treated full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And boy, you can camp on that verse. We live in a world of partiality, of hypocrisy. Um, but... I'll stay off of that. I got, I got a lesson sometime if the Lord gives me liberty of hypocrisy that surrounds us. But contention's been, been in the Bible from, from the beginning. Next item, we're going we're gonna to hit some areas where contention showed up for various reasons. Some where folks absolutely chased it. Some where both parties chased it. Some where one party chased it. And some were just thrust upon two people. And certainly the first contention of the Scripture when it comes to interpersonal is Genesis chapter 4, a pretty familiar situation uh, between Cain and Abel. And I try to imagine the earth in that day. Four pe Could you imagine an earth with only four people? You could go to Chick-fil-A and not just sit in line. It would have been great. Of course, I don't know who served them at Chick-fil-A with just four of them. But, but the Bible, again, situation there, Cain just gets mad. Contention comes from his own anger. Verse number 5, they both had made offerings. Abel and Cain had made offerings to God. Cain of the fruit of the ground, Abel of the animals. In verse 5, but unto Cain and to his offering, he being God had not respect. And Cain was very wroth which means he was pretty mad, and his countenance fell, which means he was upset. He thought he had made some good offering, and God said, no, this isn't it. And boy, since the beginning of time, it's been that way. There are people today that believe they're serving God. There are people that believe they serve God when they flew planes into buildings on September 11, 2001, that we shouldn't forget. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's amazing what people are doing to, to think they're pleasing God. And so anger drove things. And so contention can come from us. I'm just mad. Anybody ever been mad? I never have been mad in my life. It's amazing. And I don't lie very much either. Anyhow, and it is, again, if we get aggravated over things, if somebody's preaching untruth, that should get us aggravated. But is anybody a Mountaineer fan in here? I've heard rumor that Mountaineer fans get aggravated. Rich Rodriguez, you're playing Pitt. How do you not beat Pitt to get to play? Anybody remember that game? How do you not beat Pitt to go for the next championship? Well, it's because you left. You're a traitor. You're going to go to Michigan. Get out of here. And we get mad over football games. And I tell you what, it, the reason anger was created was for referees, right? Umpires, referees, oh, man. And there's, there's been examples. I, I love the one umpire of a baseball game. A guy had pitched a perfect game. A guy had pitched, for those who aren't familiar with baseball, 26, 20, when you face 27 batters and you get them all out, it's called a perfect game. Young man for the Detroit Tigers had pitched, had gotten the first 26 batters out. The 27th batter, 
A guy threw the ball to first base. He was clearly out. The guy raises his arms, and the umpire calls the man safe. And the pitcher goes, what? And after the game, the umpire's applause. says, I absolutely blew the call. And the pitcher could have gotten mad, thrown his mitt. He gets the next guy out. His perfect game is gone. His no-hitter is gone, all these other things. Anger is a part of, sadly, the human kind that we need to give over to God. Next item. We could camp on any of these items, these folks. So we don't get too far in Genesis. And a situation arises, Genesis chapter 13, not because of these two men. Genesis 13, it says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. They didn't have the problem, but their workers had a problem. Verse 7, And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And there's a message out of that. Be careful who your company is. Because it wasn't Abram and Lot, but it was their people. And again, the Canaanites and Perizzites were never going to be part of what God wanted as unconverted folks. And Abram says, let there be no strife. Let's go our separate ways. And so possessions got in the way that created contention. Have you ever heard anybody... Hopefully it's in jest. You know what kind of car I like? I like one that gets me from place to place. I really... Do you know anybody who's, who's like Ford snobs or Chevy snobs or GM snobs or truck snobs or car snobs? And you may be one of those stupid... I mean, you may be one of those biased, bigoted... I mean, not... Cut that out for the, for the internet. You may be one of those smart people. I don't know the difference between a car. I, honest, if, if I can put the key in, I, again, I've had cars. I've rented cars. I didn't know how to turn them. I remember going to a rental car place. I don't know how to turn this car on. Well, you step on the gas, sir. Well, where do I put the key? That, there is no key to put in anywhere. What? Anybody ever been there like that with me? And then you drive an electric car for the first time. I, it, it's, it died at every stoplight. It's because it's turning off, sir. So you clearly don't ever let me have your car um, or borrow it. But possessions can get in the way. Too much stuff. And especially when something happens to our stuff. You know, when I, when I go to Walmart, I park at Kroger because I don't want anybody to hit my car at Walmart. I, it's, and again, it's the nature of the beast, right? How many folks have ever had a car dinged? I won't even ask about that. I know some personal examples. That it is no fun stuff. And we can let possessions get in the way. Next item. Next, next folks, now this one's a sad situation. You talk about three. I, I think these three were pretty serious folks about serving God. And they got mad about who's in charge. All because of, and again, we, we, talk about, we talk about folks that are racist in America. Boy, that's been a big subject. Racism didn't start in the 1960s or 70s or 20s or with the KKK and some terrible things have happened. Chapter 12 of Numbers is, is a situation where Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. Why? Because of the Ethiopian woman who he had married. Oh, and I'm going to guess the Ethiopian woman did not look like she came from Sweden. Right? She probably didn't look like one of the Jewish folks. She was likely a black woman. And so they're, they're mad about that. And so because he married an Ethiopian woman, I love what the Bible says there. In case you miss it, how many folks are slow? How many folks are slow? I mean, seriously. <laughs> it says, because of the Ethiopian woman he married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. God says, in case you missed it the first time, I'll give you that the second time. And because he married an Ethiopian woman, they say, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses, hath he not also spoken by us? And the Lord heard it. You know, Aaron rarely talks in the Scripture, even though Moses said Aaron needs to be the mouthpiece. That's one of the rare times he talks. He says, who do, you, who do you think you are, Moses? You married the wrong woman. And God, of course, confirms that Moses is his man. And we can let spirituality cause contention among us. What's that got to do with us? My, I, I didn't read the article in today's paper. I know there's an article about, I believe, um, Will Graham, I think it was his name. It was in Fairmont yesterday. Is that right? I think. Well, he doesn't preach the same Bible I preach. He didn't preach the same stuff. I, and, and them singers, them singers don't sing what I sing. And I'm not here to, false doctrine is terrible. I don't, know what, I don't know what Will Graham preached. I'm assuming he preaches the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. I would wish he would use a King James Bible, but we get to be rarer and rarer. And we can get mad over all kinds of stuff. And don't get me wrong, I'm not here to promote another scripture beside KJV. I, I think if you've got something else that, that isn't KJV, boy, why, why do you have that? And so many, so many translations of Scripture that didn't come from Textus Receptus do the study out. If you start with the wrong place, you get to the wrong place. And if you've got a Bible that Westcott and Hort translated for you, let me know and I'll get you, I'll get you a truth. Because those guys were unbelievers translating the Scripture, which, which is crazy. I, I, I encourage you to do a study on why we have the King James Bible. And the fact that, and, and what led to that, and some of the, again, historically what happened is just, again, God's in divine intervention is amazing. Going back to the Spanish Armada and some of the other things that have happened. But we can fight over spirituality, and you know what? 
Every time we have a guest preacher, we fight over spirituality. Man, that guy's boring. I, I, I think I'll go. I think I'll stay. I think I'll go listen to somebody else online. I, I think I'll. You know what? We're, sometimes we as people, we can, be, we can be like Goldilocks. That preacher's too long. That preacher's too short. Talking in how long they speak, right? And we've had people in the pulpit here, and again, I'll, I'll name names. When Jerry Savinsky preaches, you're not going to get an hour. You're not going to get an hour message. Brother Savinsky will get you with the left hand and let you know in 20 minutes. Bang, he's done. Sam Davidson, 20 minutes. He's got. He's not even through his introduction. Now, should I like one of those versus another? I'm a big fan. Be, I, we should be done when God's done. We should be thankful. If you, if you like short pre, short preaching, you'd hated Paul. He's preaching till midnight till people are falling out of the third, out of the ceiling and they're dying, man. They're so passing out. We ought not pick and choose spirituality. And again, I'm not talking about false doctrine. We should uh, absolutely false doctrine is false doctrine. It's wrong. I don't care who. I don't care if the right preacher preaches the wrong thing. It's wrong. But we pick and choose what we what we like among God's things. Like even this of Bible school. I got Bible school. I just don't care about this silly stuff. Could you mind if I come up here and start teaching you Bible school terms? Hey, everybody, we're going on a jungle adventure. Are you ready? Okay, who wants to be on the blue team? Bunch of dead people. How many folks have ever been like Vester Arnold, Miss Arnold? Man, they were just, you talk about animated. If you never got to see them in action in Bible school, just tremendous. Not <laughs> drive me crazy. Anyhow, spirituality, we pick and choose. Don't do that. Next item. Next item, again, two folks that had it thrust upon them. In 2 Samuel, we have the, the death of, of Saul the king. And most times, the son of the king became the king, which was Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth was the, the, would have been the natural king, but except God had said, no, David is the king. He anointed him that way. But in 2 Samuel chapter 2, there was this dis disparity because Abner, who was the leader of Saul's host, the leader of the army in verse number 8, took Ishbosheth to be king. But as verse number 10 lets us know, David was leading the house of Jude, and ultimately David's going to be king. So there was this battle of, of who's in charge. And if you don't think America has that problem today, I'm not really sure who's in charge. And that's not meant to be an aspersion against our current president. But it is, it is pure lunacy what I see coming out of our United States government. We need to pray for our nation. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, and, and this, again... This is, this, is not, this is not slamming or pro or anything else. This is my understanding of how COVID vaccination works. And again, I'm not for it or against it. You do what you believe God would have you to do. My understanding, here's what COVID vaccine does. It doesn't prevent you from getting it. It doesn't prevent you from spreading it. It doesn't prevent you from getting it asymptomatically. But we, but we need to get, I even heard something in Fox News that claims it's fair and balanced. I, heard, I saw something yesterday that said there was a doctor that said 340 million Americans have been vaccinated with COVID in the United States. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. For one pretty simple reason, there aren't 340 million people in America, much less that they all got vaccinated. And so it becomes, what, what is truth? Wear one mask, wear two masks, wear six masks. And again, I encourage you to go check out Rand Paul, Rand Paul's fun to Rand Paul and Dr. Fauci, I didn't realize are really good buddies. Um, if you get a chance to check them out. And how many folks have seen Dr. Rand Paul talk with Dr. Fauci? That's, that's, I, I would encourage you to check that out just, just, for the, just for fun's sake. But our leaders struggle with each other. What's, what's, we don't, what is infrastructure? Infrastructure is now people. It is a mixed message. And so it's not on you. So you say, well, this battle in government has been has just now started. No, it's, it was you know, thousands of years ago, even in David Nishbosheth's day, as to who was going to be in charge. Next item. So contention shows up, lots of circles. And again, two guys that I think are going to be blessed in heaven. I don't know about you. I don't know exactly the rewards Paul and Barnabas are going to get in heaven, but I feel pretty comfortable trading. I'd be willing to say, hey, I'll trade you. But even these two guys who were serious, these guys were serious missionaries. But in Acts chapter 15, verse 36 starts out and says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see what they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them Saul, whose surname, or to, to, to take John, whose surname was Mark. And again, John Mark had left them in an earlier journey. Verse 38, But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia. Paul said, Man, this guy's a deadbeat, man. Go. I think Paul and Barnabas had different spiritual gifts. Pastors preached on that. Paul was, hey, he left us once, and I'm going to let him leave us twice. And verse 39, what a sad statement. And the contention was so sharp between them 
that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and went and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Saul, Silas. And both of them are successful. Paul's missionary journeys continue in the book of Acts, and we see at the end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy, where Paul says, hey, take, bring John Mark, for he's profitable for the ministry. So both of them were successful, but they were battling over a person. Why did churches split? Again, I've, I've never been part of a church split, thankfully, but my understanding is that that's not uncommon. And it can be about personalities. It can be about situations. It can be about you know, things. And that is unfortunate. We don't fight over people. We, again, we need to recognize who the enemy is. The enemy is not us. The enemy is Satan who's alive and well, seeking to devour and destroy people. And is sadly doing an outstanding job in America. A, again, the, I, I read too much to try to keep aware of, of culture. And I, I read about five icons of humanity on, on Yahoo yesterday. And... and the testimony of one is some days I wake up like an English boy and some days I wake up like a, a green-haired girl. And, and back when I was a child, that would be a problem. And today, this is a hero. This is, a, this is somebody we should just be excited about. Satan is alive and well deluding folks. Next item. Let's not fight over people. Let's not fight among each other. And then the Corinthian church, even better. You know what? If you hear me lead singing, there are some songs that I have, I have a brutal time with. If you want to give me the torture, I get to lead songs sometimes. And so I shouldn't say that because we're going to be doing songs here later on. I may butcher one of those. Um, Silent Night is not made for my voice range. When I sleep in heavenly peace, that heavenly peace is a brutal one. Sleep it out. That's a tough note. Matt Craig, much better singer than I am. Or even let Jason lead to singing. Or let Brother George lead to singing. You know, we can fight over who we want to lead to singing or who do we want... Corinthians did. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Getting to, Paul says, not only did they fight over who they thought should be the leader, it was well known about them. Verse number 11 says, For it hath been declared unto me of you by brethren, by them of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Again, if we're here and saying, man, if, if Pastor's going to let Pastor Jason preach, I ain't coming. Pastor's going to let Pastor Matt preach, oh man, I ain't going to do that. Neither. If ain't Pastor Matt's, I'm out. Shame on us. But it is, again, it's ironic. I've been around a long time. When, the, when whoever the lead pastor is, isn't there, it tends to be the crowds are smaller. Why is that? Is it because everybody got sick at the same time? God called me to stay home with my kids? I, we ought not pick and choose. God's in charge. And again, I've heard, I've heard that this is back in the day when Pastor Darrington was here. We had a gentleman here on a New Year's Eve service that had a stuttering challenge. Oh, man, it was brutal to try to pay attention. So should I get up and leave? No. No, oh, leadership's important. It's important to follow leadership. Next item. I think it's the last one, and I have the question mark there because the Bible never really tells us what the problem was. But again, I feel sorry for Yodius and Syntyche, or however they would pronounce their names. The only mention they get in the Scripture is in Philippians 4.2, and it's because Paul's busting on them. He says, I beseech you, Yodius, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And get along with each other, women. Oh, man. And we don't even know why. You know, did they get mad about something on Pinterest or on Etsy? Did they, I mean, did they, get mad, did they get mad about, you know, we don't want the green leaves, we want the dark green, the light. I mean, who knows? And it struck me as funny. How many times do we as people get upset about something that really doesn't matter? I got upset about the carpet. I got upset about the temperature. I got upset about, you know, they, they gave my kid all the red gummy bears. He kept all the green ones for themselves. That kind of ticked me off in the nursery. You know, they give my kid generic animal crackers. I want the good ones. I don't want that generic, you know. If cereal were, if cereal were in a bag, that cereal in a bag's no good. Get the cereal in the boxes. Don't be feeding my kid, you know, Cheerios out of it, or fake Cheerios, Odeos. Give them good Dr. Pepper, not Dr. Whizbang. We'll get the good stuff. We as people get mad about all kind of crazy things. And so contention comes. What do we need? You know what? We get to control that. Again, it's a pet peeve. They made me mad. No, you made you mad. Nobody makes you mad. We choose to be angry. And it's, again, it's the nature of people. So I, I say that just to set us up. Is, it's not surprising that God has to warn these, these believers about wars and fighting because that's the nature of humanity since, the, sadly, the beginning of humanity. Next page, if we could. And so the nature of the battle, verses 1 and 2, that talks about coming from our members, sadly comes from us. That lust that's in verse number 1 comes from a Greek word, that, that leads to a word called hedonism. And hedonism is nothing more than a fancy word of, I do whatever I want to do so I can have pleasure. And we live in a great America. I don't know about you. I, 
I've, I've lived in houses without air conditioning. I like air conditioning over non-air conditioning. I do like forced heat. I do like heat in my house. I mean, I, the old stories, again, when I was a kid, we, had to, we got wood for the fireplace and all that stuff. And wood fireplaces are kind of cool. But those are pretty hard to regulate, right? Do you ever try to get the thermostat quite right on your wood fireplace or your coal fireplace? How many folks have ever cooked on a stove that didn't have a temperature control? Not called a barbecue grill. I remember as a kid, we had just, this has been way back, I'm, I'm an old guy, where you put coal in, or some kind of fuel inside and it just heated up. I don't know how anybody ever cooked. I can barely cook when, you, when the microwave says, hit, put it for one minute. And I love those microwave, how many folks are smart enough, those microwave foods that tell you if, you're, if your microwave is a certain wattage, here's how long you're supposed to put it in for? Does anybody know how many watts your microwave is? I didn't know it was going to be a quiz. But we as people like pleasure. And America's done a great job. I mean, porcelain fixtures in a restroom are far nicer. How many folks have ever been to a bathroom on the mission field? Whew. I remember going to a restaurant in Haiti. And there was, here's your concrete block, sir. Well, where, where's the water? Where's my hand sanitizer? <laughs> they didn't have the Purell dispenser there in the Haitian restaurant. I was, I was just floored. In fact, they didn't even have a sink in the Haitian restaurant, much less. Anyhow. We like pleasure, and God understands that. We need to be careful. I love the two verses, Galatians 1.10 and Galatians 2.20, that Paul understands that we like ourselves. We like pleasure. We like, we like to feel good. Galatians 1.10, again, if you need a like verse, this isn't a bad one. For do I now persuade men or God, do I, or do I seek to please men? For if, I, for if I should please men, for if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And you might say, I don't want to be the servant of Christ. Okay, that's a poor choice. That's why God saved us, is to be servants of Christ. But if I want to be a servant of Christ, pleasing men is not the place. And again, it's, it's, again folks can take that to extreme. I don't care what people are going to say, I'm going to do what I want to do. No, that's not what it is either. But pleasing men seems is cave into a world system that's contrary to the Bible. Again, God has set up human government, a lesson for another time. But unless human government crosses this book, we, we better be careful. As, are we doing it because we want to do it or because it's because we, we feel like it's right? Galatians 2.20, tremendous verse. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you imagine going to Jesus saying, well, Jesus, I didn't serve you because it was too hot that day. And he's going to say, let me show you a picture of Calvary. Jesus, people didn't like me. Yeah, yeah, been there, done it. Jesus, I, it, was, it was too hard. I had to live a hard life. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I like, I like being comfortable. I like, I like self. But I need to be the place to say, hey God, you're more important than I am. I don't think anybody goes to the mission field to have a, a, a picnic and a vacation. From what few mission fields I've been on, man. I mean, San Ramon, Peru, beautiful place but not a place I'd want to go live. I didn't see a whole lot of, I didn't, you know, I, the, it was back in the day that internet cafes were costing a blue fortune. Folks just woke up, the sun came up, you got up and did some things and the sun went down. They really didn't care who won the basketball game. They really didn't care who won the NCAA championship. They really didn't care. You know, they didn't care about having the Nintendo NES or Wii's or any of these other things. We need to make sure, hey, what are we, what are we chasing after? Next item. And the battle is within us. The Bible says that in James. It talks about war in our members and the members being us as, as people. I know the Bible will use the word members about us, about parts of us individually. And pastor's been preaching out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as part of the spiritual gifts activity. And he lets us know that us as members, we're not all created the same with the same sets of talents and the same skill sets. He talks about one being an eye, one being an arm, and one being some other, other pieces. Verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about those members which we think to be less honorable, and he talks about comely parts. Hey, there's some that bring more to the party. But we're all supposed to be fit together, verse 27, as the body of Christ. We need to be working together. When we're fighting among each other, it's like our body fighting against itself, which is certainly problematic. Verse number, Ephesians 4.25, great verse that ends up, for we are members one of another, starting with it, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Ephesians 5.30, which is in that passage about wives and husbands and that relationship that, they, that we have as married folks, it says, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his, of his bones. And we're all supposed to be working together. But the challenge becomes the battle between us really starts with a battle within us. 
Romans 7, 23 that says, But I see another law in my members. This time Paul talking members about himself physically. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing to captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. It's that expression of I want to do right. I know how to do right. I just don't do it. Anybody ever been there? Man, I know I shouldn't have said that, but I did. Man, I know I should have done this, but I didn't. Man, I should have witnessed that person, but I didn't. Man, I should have given, I should have given to that offering, but I didn't. Those battles within us shows of battles among us. And the encouragement is to defuse those things. For us to say, hey, if you get anything out of the lesson, hey, let's defuse. If there's, if there's issues between us, don't let them be because of a cause by you. And, you. and again, we can rub each other wrong. And it's important if somebody does something incorrect scripturally, hey, go to them and, and love and say, hey, we need to fix that. God lays that out for us. But we ought to be folks to defuse problems, not to create them. Next, next item. Sadly, we can be like a little kid. Anybody ever been with a little kid that, do you want to eat that? No. Anybody ever, isn't that the blessing word from a little kid? No. And they say it like that, right? They don't ever say, oh, no, thank you, please. I would rather have the Brussels sprouts. No, keep the ice cream. <laughs> it's the little kid attitude that shows up here. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you, may, you ask and miss that you may consume it upon your own lust. And the lusts are the things that we like. And it's... That same word doesn't show up in the Greek word that doesn't show up very often shows up in Luke chapter 12 in the situation with the parable of the rich man where the Bible says the ground of a certain rich man brought forth penalty and he said, hey, what am I going to go do? I need to, where am I going to put all my stuff? And he says, I know what I'll do. I'll build, pull down barns and build greater and there I'll bestow all my goods. And God tells him, hey, you fool, tonight your, your soul will be, desi be desire, required of you. And verse 21 gives the message, so that he is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Is God against riches? And the answer is no, because Abraham was a rich man. Solomon was a rich man. There are many rich. We as Americans are rich folks. I don't think there's anything wrong with having things. That's where it's exciting to see on the board back there, yeah, a, a significant number going toward missions. I won't say it since we're online, but it's got six digits in it. Hey, that's good. Where does it come from? It comes from people like you and I saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to give up a, a, a Dairy Queen blizzard so, so we can send the gospel around the world. Hey, I'm going to give up a Little Caesars pizza. I'm going to give up a trip to the park. I'm going to give up X. Because I don't know about you, does anybody have so much money you don't know what to do with it all? And if so, I can help you. See me after class. I mean, God laid on my heart to give to Faith Promise Missions for years, and we do it. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. It's that attitude that says, I want to be rich toward God. Do you have to say dead to, I want what I want? I can always find something else to do with money. And again, I, I collect ball cards. And there's, I, you, I never, I don't have them all. And it is, a, it, to me, it is amazing the money that is being spent on sports collectibles. I've seen, it, it, no kidding, pictures, little pieces of cardboard with pictures of people's, of athletes on them, where people are paying six figures and seven figures to the left of the decimal point for a ball card. I have a card that was in a box at my house that I put on eBay, and some, some American that I appreciate paid me $162.50. It's a picture of Kevin Durant. There you go. And I got three of them here, and you have another one. What is, what is this? What are we doing? I was glad he was doing it. I mean, hope Kevin does well. Anyhow, I got two more to sell. Do we just want stuff for us? And boy, that's, that's a tough, I mean, it's, it's easy to get into this mindset, I need to be poor, I need to eat nothing but beans and cornbread, and I, I need to get rid of everything that I have, and I need to live in a shack, and maybe I could live on the road. I don't think God want, doesn't want you to be destitute, God wants you to be responsible. But if having things gets in the way of doing what God would have you to do, get rid of the things. I've said, God, if you want me, again, I got ball cards, I like collecting things, but if God said, get rid of them all, hey, we'll go get rid of them all. Because my ball cards are not more important than my creator. And I don't know what your stuff is or that stuff is. God against fishing. And it's easy for us as people. I could preach against fishing. If you own a fishing boat, you're out of the will of God. You know why? Because I don't like to go fishing. I could care less. If I wanted to go fish, if God wants to go fishing, he wouldn't have created Long John Silver. I mean, it, come on, let's be serious here. Mrs. Pauls would have never made fish sticks if God wanted you to go fishing. But we ought to examine ourselves. Again, are there things in our life that get in the way of serving God? If your campsite gets in the way of serving God, get rid of your campsite. Again, if my ball cards get in the way of serving God, get rid of my ball cards. If, if my obsession with Mountaineer sports get in the way of serving God, then get them tempered back. 
Next item. And it, it, it looks kind of a weird sentence, why matters when I pray? Well, wait a minute. No, the, the word why matters. Why you pray matters. That last part, you, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. God, give me something because I need it for me. The, the Lord's example, I didn't put John 17, his, Jesus' specific prayer, but when Luke chapter 11, when the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, teach us how to pray, there's not a whole lot in there for self. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's about you. It's focusing on God. Thy kingdom come. God, we want you, t today should be the day we're looking for Jesus to come back to take us home. Thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Gives us that right perspective. And give us day by day our daily bread. Just give me what I need. Is there anything wrong for asking for things that you like? I don't believe so. But if my, if my sole motivator on a consistent basis is life's about me, shame on me. I need to pray for somebody to get saved, not because I love them, but because they need Christ. There's people I pray for that I really don't even like to get saved. There's some people that are just <laughs> not the nicest people, but I pray for them to get saved because they need to trust Christ as Savior. What's my motivator to pray for folks? What's, my, what, what's the motivator? And again, it's, I'm, I'm not discounting the fact we should pray for love. We should pray for physical health. We should pray for each other. We should pray for our spiritual leaders. I, I, pray for, I pray for President Biden every day just like I prayed for President Trump every day and President Obama before him. And if you're somebody that liked all three of their sets of policies, you're a confused person because there's not a whole lot of commonality among those three in their policies. But why do I pray for them? I pray for them because God tells me that we might live quiet, peaceful lives. I want to see righteousness reign in America. Whatever it takes. I mean, it's one of those, whatever it takes on the Supreme Court, whatever it takes in Congress, that sin be sin and righteousness be righteousness because I know that's the best for America because that's what God lays out. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not an independent. I try to, babe, what is God's perspective on things? Is that's where I want to be when it comes to praying for my leaders. Next dot. We'll go to the next page. And why, why shouldn't we be a friend of the world? You know, the world's got lots to offer. The world's got lots of things. And God uses that word adulteresses, not used very often in Scripture. In fact, I could only find a handful of places. Romans chapter 7, God specifically talks about marriage. Paul talks about that the woman who is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if the husband be dead, then, then she's loose from that law. But verse 3 says, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. And so it's like, what, what does that mean, worldly adulteress? The relationship of, human, of, of male and female, of husband and wife, is an intimate relationship. When we get intimate with the world and the system, again, I had cr good Christian folks get on me when my kids played ball. Why do you take your kids on Wednesday night from ball games to church? Because I don't want them to let them think ball games are more important than church. We are letting your team down. <laughs> okay, I got a choice of letting my... Uh, let me correct you there. I don't let my team down because any, any, when we had kids playing ball, we'd always go to the coach say, Coach, Wednesday nights we're not going to be here. Yeah. Don't schedule games if you can, but if you are, hey, we're leaving at X time. If you have a game at 4 o'clock, hey, they can play till 6. Life's good. But if you schedule a game Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, my kids won't even show up. I'm not going to let your team down. I'm going to be honest with you. Because i got to stand before God and say, well, hey, why did we do that? We would go on vacation. And we would go on. Back in the day when you used to have to go, to, when you went to churches on vacation, now you get to, I, I participate here by, by watching online. Because some churches still kind of frown upon you. We've been in some churches in some crazy places. I still remember time in Buffalo, New York. We went to a parking lot where the church was supposed to be. And if that was where the church was, something was wrong because we were in the wrong place. Because when I stand before God and say, hey, did you, did you take your kids to church? Yeah. And we've been, again, we were in a wild church. I asked my wife about the one in Arizona. You talk about, whew. We were in a church where Calvinism was the law of the land, and that was, that was a little different. That led to some interesting post-church discussion. What were they talking about? Never mind. A bunch of wackos. Burn them down. Anyhow. And God takes this, this stuff so seriously. Again, I, I make light there because there's nothing funny about adultery. Hosea, I, I'll tell you what. I want to go shake Hosea's hand because he was told, if you're not familiar with the book of Hosea, Hosea's commandment, I'm glad I'm not an Old Testament prophet. This is what God told him. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and a children of whoredom, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. God, I think I misunderstood you. And he marries a woman that's just, as you might figure out, a tramp. And in chapter 2, she is out chasing after the people who she was being of infidelity with and ultimately realized, hey, Hosea was taking care of her. 
when we chase after the world stuff, we're telling God, God, we are like the harlot chasing after immorality. You might say, boy, that's pretty serious. That's, a, that's God's view of us sucking up to the world. We need to, again, that's God's words, not my words. Terrible place. We don't want to be there. Next item. Here's a reason not to be. We could stop right there and say, here's a reason not to be. You know, what, what, why did he save us? He didn't even save us for us. You know, we sing a lot of songs about, about the things that we get. I mean, one of my favorite songs is when we all get to heaven, right? What a day of rejoicing that will be. But what's the real purpose we're saved? Verse number 16. I'll go to verse 16 of Matthew chapter 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may glorify your fa- that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, life is not about us. And again, I'm, I, I'm guilty. I like me. But life's not about me. My job is not about me. My teaching this lesson is not about me. It's about Him. Our life ought to be consumed with how do we glorify Him. And no doubt about it, we get lots of blessings along the path. If all we had was salvation, we would be blessed. But I'll tell you what, I, I, I do say this when I say tip top. I live in the greatest country on the face of the planet. My wife and kids love me, and, I live in the, and, and Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I vary the order of different times. If all I had was Jesus Christ dying for my sins, and my wife and kids didn't love me, and I lived in some awful country, if I lived in North Korea or some other awful place, I'd still be blessed beyond measure. But we haven't made. We had a chance to glorify Him. I mean, I, I, you got time for a story? We really don't. I'm almost out of time, but I'll use it anyway. I'm talking to the trash. We stayed at this timeshare, and I'm talking to the trash guy who's picking up trash. And this guy is just out. It's a 90-degree day, and he's got trash, and people have thrown it all over the place, and he's picking it up, scooping it up, blah, blah, blah. And Lord laid on my heart to go give him a gift card for Burger King, $15 gift card to Burger King. That's you know, huge bucks. And this guy got the biggest smile. And said, oh, thank you, thank you. I say, hey, I'm just a Christian guy doing what God had me do. So I appreciate that. You have been a blessing today. I don't know where that guy's going to go for eternity. I don't know what the situation is. But I want to be light and salt to the garbage guy. The garbage guy didn't do anything for me. I didn't have to do anything nice to him. In fact, he was in my way. Your truck's in my way. Get your garbage truck out of my way. Life's short. And even if Paul says, am I in your way? I said, no, buddy, you take your time. I got a crossword puzzle book. I'll be able to do some puzzles, man. Just do what you need to do. What are we doing to be a blessing to the garbage guy? And you might say, do you do that? No. I try to listen to what God would have me to do. And sometimes it is the garbage. Sometimes it's the, it's the person there at Subway. It looks like they've had a terrible day and is hating their job and hating life. And sometimes it's the neighbor who, again, neighbor had surgery and we mow their lawns. and we do, I, yeah, You do what you're supposed to do to be light and salt. We got, again, we got Saturation Saturday coming up, not this Saturday, not this Saturday but the following Saturday. Opportunity to go out and witness for, the, for Savior. Why are we doing that on a regular basis? How do we give testimony to His greatness? Next item. And Satan's role in friend and foe, is pretty serious. Satan, and again, I know I'm short on time. I'm not going to be excited to see people end up in hell. That's awful to consider. I mean, I don't care. Osama bin Laden, Adolf Hitler, there have been some hum- ter- terrible human beings. But I'm not going to be excited about any of them going to hell. But when Satan gets thrown into the lake of fire, I think I might. I'm not a big clapping and cheering person. But I might clap and cheer. Because this is what he does. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest, not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, whose image of God, should shine to them. Satan willfully deceives people. His purpose is to deceive people that they might end up in the lake of fire. What kind of cretin are you? That's what the prince of the power of the air does, is a deceiver. And again, he is alive and well in America. Next, next item. The world's path is corrupt because it comes from him. Satan's, again, the Bible calls him the prince. Is, he is the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2. It says, where in in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And verse number three puts it well. The folks that live in the lust of their flesh, the desires of the mind and of the, of the mind, and nature, by nature children of wrath. Satan is alive to see. That's why we shouldn't be friends of the world, because the leader is a destroyer and his path is terrible. Next item. We've got to choose. You know, Joshua said, I choose you this day who you must serve. We have to choose which one we're going to serve. Are we going to be a friend of the world? Are we going to choose the world's path? Are we going to choose God's path? Are we going to do things His way or our own way? First John 2, 15, that talks about love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When we willfully make a choice to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with, with a world system that's contrary to this book, we have said, God, I want to be your enemy. Let's not be there. Next item. 
And the true problem, verse number 5, it says, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Genesis 6, 5 described a pre-flood world where the, the heart of man was deceitful and evil. Romans 7, 18 talked about that. We, we mentioned that earlier. There is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. The real problem is, hey, we, we are in and of ourselves without Christ. We like sin. It's the nature of us. Next item. And the only solution is salvation. It's exciting where God lays out the problem, but in verse number 6, he summarizes, says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. He says pretty much the same thing in 1 Peter 5, 5. In fact, he uses those, those exact words in 1 Peter 5, 5. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. To defeat worldly is we need to go to God and say, God, I need help to do what you have. Just as I needed help to be saved, I can't do anything by myself to be saved. I need his help to serve him. Because I like the bright lights. I like, so I like to be liked. I like to fit in. I like when everybody cheers and applauds when I do things. But the world system is not consistent with him. So I want to build out the last page. I know we're, I think, a minute over. Three simple questions. When it comes to our prayer life, what are we praying for and why? Are we praying for America to straighten up so that our bank accounts are big and our stock and our 401ks are good and, and life is easy? Or are we praying for America because sin is destroying us? In what areas do I allow the world to be my friend? And boy, again, you could go all over the place with that. I, I like sports, and I could let sports run my life, and it is disturbing, the attitude of, of sports mentalities. I mean, it is pretty much in every major sporting event. There are promotional days that promote homosexuality. I know, and it, it is interesting, there used to be most, most Major League Baseball teams had a faith day where they'd have Christian people speak. Those, this, from what I've seen, have been less and less. If I let sports run my life, if the Olympics are going to be on for two weeks, I could let the Olympics run my life. And is there anything wrong with Olympic sports? Well, there's some where, uh, I guess in beach volleyball, you're not allowed to wear clothes. You're not allowed to run around in your underwear. But if I let the Olympics run my life for two weeks, and don't tell, I, I spent 10 hours in watching Olympics and I got 15 seconds for praying, well, obviously something's wrong. If your job gets in the way, we could go on and on and on. Don't let anything get in the way of service to the king. And when it comes to pride, that last one, I, I take that one personally when it comes to wh where does pride hinder me? You know, it's not about putting together cute little slides and having stories and having this and that. I fight life's about me every day because I like me. I get frustrated when people get in my way. A again, the highways are I use the highway examples all the time because they're such great examples. If you get frustrated on the highway that, you're, that they cut you off because it interrupted your prayer time, well, that's a good reason to get out. If you just got mad because, you got, because it was about you, shame on me and you. Let the Holy Spirit examine and say, hey, God, show me the areas where, where I hinder myself because I hinder you and get rid of those things. Because we need to be all on the same page. We're living in a world that has gone nuts. Pick up the target flyer. You can pick up, again, simple, simple flyers and advertisements let you know we're living in a world that is different than what God would have us to be. God help us to, to get, out of our, get out of his way that he might be to shine through us. We need to be light and salt because we live in a world that needs him. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we love you. Lord, help us to be friends and not foes. Uh, Lord, we pray you, uh, as the psalmist said, search us, O God, in our hearts. Try us and know our thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in us. Lord, if it's pride, if it's worldliness. Uh, Lord, the world has lots of cool things. Uh, you're not against iPhones because they're great for technology. It's great to be able to communicate uh, around the world and find out what's going on in Mission Field. We can find out immediately uh, what's happening in the various countries through technology. Uh, but Lord, help us not to get sucked into technology that will distract from you. Lord, it's, you give us entertainment and pleasure devices, but Lord, help us not to let those things run our lives. Uh, but Lord, let them be vehicles by which we can propagate the gospel. Lord, we love you and we need you. Well, we pray for the service to follow that you're working hard for Bible school this week that you bless and direct. Lord, help us to honor you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks.